and we're ready to go. So, Bruce. Well, good morning. Welcome to our crop insurance decision webinar. Uh, I'm Bruce Sherrick. Uh, Gary Schnitke has been talking as well, and we'll be uh, going through some materials related to our crop insurance decisions for 2020. Want to, as always, thank our webinar sponsor today. It's Compeer Financial. Uh, Compeer, the farm credit system institution serving much of the Upper Midwest. Uh, thank you very much for their support. So to organize our thinking, we're going to start with kind of a crop insurance overview. Just walk through some of the really critical issues that affect crop insurance every year, and then give a little bit of historic context for that as well. And then move directly into some tools we think are really incredibly valuable. Uh, one will be a premium calculator, an online tool that you can use to look kind of all at once at all the possible combinations of products and coverage levels for your own farm. Uh, that one gets a lot of traffic. Then we're going to say, and what happens when you buy crop insurance? The crop insurance payment evaluator tool, a second one we'll look at that evaluates the, the likelihood for payments, uh, size of payments, frequency of payments, and the impact on risk reduction of alternative choices around crop insurance. Uh, following that, we're going to look quickly at a price distribution and evaluation tool. If you followed the markets over the weekend and followed the, the prices down, uh, we'll show you um, kind of an interesting way that the markets summarize the information about their likelihoods for future price changes as well. And then also go through the SCO crop insurance decisions for this year. So we're going to dive right in. Uh, first, let's take a look at what's actually happened so far. As you know, the crop insurance is defined very much by projected prices and volatility factors that are established each year by RMA. And this uh, top left side of this uh, screen shows all the way back to 2011. So the last 10 years effectively of projected prices, the resulting harvest prices and the volatility. Projected price for corn is the average during February of the DEES futures contract, and for soybeans, of course, the November contract averaged during the month of February. Volatility taken from the options markets last five days averaged out for the period of time insurance will be in force. And a couple of interesting patterns. Uh, we're clearly at a very low projected price. The only time lower was 2016. And for corn, 388. For uh, soybeans, 917. And those numbers, despite the fact that they're low relative to historic insurance prices, are above the current futures prices. And that is an important feature of insurance because insurance will already give you some um, kind of guarantee for a higher price uh, relative to what the markets are telling us the kind of equilibrium prices would be. Uh, the second row in each panel for corn and soybeans shows the harvest price and the higher of the harvest or projected price is highlighted in each case or bolded. And in corn, uh, the harvest price has been below the projected price ever since 2012. 2012, of course, the drought year where we had a, a summer price rally and it stuck through the fall. Uh, but even last year with the um, remarkable spring and, and late planting and wet conditions, uh, the projected price was still above harvest price for um, uh, 2019 in both cases. Soybeans, a very similar story with the one exception in 2016 where harvest price was higher than projected price. But even more critical, we think, is the continued decline in the volatility factor. The volatility factor gives a measure of the variability of prices. And of course, the lower you get, the harder it is for prices to continue to go down. At least we kind of hope so. And the volatility factors have become rather muted, rather uh, small relative to history. Again, the volatility factor has a lot to do with the premiums that we'll, we'll talk through and walk through in a few more slides. But the lower the volatility, the less expensive crop insurance should be. Likewise, the lower the projected price, the less costly crop insurance is when it's denominated in revenue because you're starting with a lower multiple to multiply your um, <clears throat> eventual uh, bushels buy. So the bottom parts are just visual, graphical representations of the same information, but important to kind of recognize how high 2012 and the follow-on 2013 were relative to the reasonably stable period since that point in time. Uh, Gary, I'll, I'll kind of turn it over to you to kind of talk through some more of the materials on historic performance. 
Yeah, so we're going to just give you a little background now on crop insurance for 2019 as that leads into uh, 2020. And so obviously the last year, the big story was prevent plant. Um, to give you a feel of the impact on impact on loss ratios, you see those loss ratios right here for corn and soybeans in Illinois. So a loss ratio is total payments for, on the insurance product divided by total premiums. And sort of a, uh, a, a benchmark here is one. So if we're looking at this one, if we have a loss ratio one, that would mean that Payments equal premiums, and when you get above that, um, payments exceed premiums. Obviously, our big year here for corn was 2012. And going back to 2012, this was the year in which we had a very high loss ratio, and loss ratios during that year are in Illinois are very much impacted by droughts. The number of times we have a drought will have a large impact on how we view a crop insurance uh, performance. In recent years, uh, both corn and soybeans have had very low loss ratios, and we've hit some very low numbers, particularly in 2018. But going back here, 2018, 2017, 2016, all of those numbers for both corn and soybeans were well below 0.5, which means that we had very low losses compared to the premiums that we paid in. Right now, and this is as of last week, Loss ratio for corn and soybeans in Illinois was right at one. That's still a preliminary number as, as not all, all the payments have been made. And we still have to add to this the payments on group products or, 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 or ARP products and SCO. So we had some SCO last year as well. So we won't know those payments till roughly June of this year. So, but still, if we're looking at it right now, 1.0 loss ratio is not indicative of a large loss ratio for 2019. That loss ratio for 2019 might end up higher. It will end up higher than that one. Um, maybe at the outside, 1.5, we'll just see. But in any case, it's not going to be anything near like the losses we experienced in 2012. So if we're concerned at all about... Uh, rising premiums in the futures because of 2019 performance, it's probably, I mean, 2019, while it was a bad year and from a loss and loss from a loss perspective, it was also a bad year, but still not like 2012. Here is what we saw insured for and for corn last year. And here's the big deal. Almost everybody is using RP. So this is corn. 95, 94% of the policies in Illinois were RP policies, and let me restate that. Percent of acres insured in Illinois were 94% were RP. And you can see here, 42% was at 85%, 32% at the 80, 15% at the 75. So most, uh, most Illinois acres are insured at very high coverage levels. If we look at this some more, this is mainly uh, northern and central Illinois using these higher coverage levels. If we go to southern Illinois, we see those in the 80 to 75 percent coverage level area. If anything, in the past, we've seen this grow, more and RP grow, and the big one that has been declining is this ARP as people have moved to uh, RP policies. The other policy that has gained some acres is margin protection, but that's still right under 200,000 acres total for the state, and so it's it's not not that that large of a factor yet. It's it's grown, but not as large of a factor. The big the big um, big one is still RP, and you can see we still we use those at high coverage levels. Last year, the story was prevent plant. This, this map shows prevent plant as a percent of total acres. And you can see here, we had some a large prevent plant uh, areas, particularly in northern and central Illinois and southern Illinois. And so if you think about it or you want a visual of this, we had large, uh, large prevent plant here in northern 
some more large in southern and in the middle here we didn't have large loss or large prevent plant acres here in the middle part of the state um, so you know prevent plant was a big deal and you can see again that in these particular areas we had 20 to 24 percent of the acres that were that, that were taken as prevent plant again it's a regional perspective um, and even in Illinois, it's a regional between northern and southern Illinois having much larger prevent plant than the center part of the state. Again, prevent plant big in, in, in Ohio and north, south, north and south Dakota, and we here had, had our share of prevent plant. Zeroing in on Illinois, here are the Illinois acres in prevent plant, and this is specifically those uh, those uh, those acres that were were taken prevent plant for crop insurance. Most of those acres were corn prevent plant. Our winners of the winners of the lottery are here, Bureau County, and this would be um, so southern Southern Illinois. Also had had its share 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 of of, of prevent plant acres as well. Again. Uh, if you're looking at at uh, the 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 middle part of the state, we're not seeing very large prevent plant acres. All right, last year we got to June 5th. June 5th is the final plant date for corn over much of the state. One of the things that we saw is 50% of the acres in Illinois went in uh, after or in June. So we saw saw a lot of corn planted. Um, uh, of uh, uh, in southern southern Illinois, and this happens to be a picture of southern Illinois here. In so, but May thirty first is 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 in is southern Illinois. One of the things that I think we learned from last year is once we reach that final plant date, and that's a specific date for crop insurance, uh, June 5th, again, and, 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 and it's misnamed in some respects. Once we reach the June 5th final plant date, you can take a prevent plant payment. You can still plant, but you can take a prevent plant payment. At this point in time, if we're planning for 2020, and hopefully we won't get there, and chances are we will not get have, have as large of a prevent plant as we did last year, the presumption, I think, should be once we reach that date, you don't plant and you take prevent plant, particularly if you have a high coverage level. Again, those uh, prevent plant dates on the left here, you see June 5th, May 31st, and then soybeans, June 15th and June 20th. Again, June 5th is corn in most of Illinois, June 15th and then June 20th is, is soybeans. Once again, we reach that final plant date, you can take the prevent plant payment. And by the way, once you reach that, it doesn't matter what the conditions are in the field. June 6th, 7th and 8th can be beautiful conditions, but you're you don't have to justify not planting after the final plant date. One thing to remember if you, is that if you do plant after that date, um, your guarantee if you plant is going down, it's going down 1% per day, and after we reach the end of the final plant period, it's 60% of initial guarantee. So the later you plant, the less coverage you are getting from crop insurance. Again, P putting this in this 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 sort of in in, in a perspective here, um, last year we saw a lot of people plant after the that f final plant date. Um, probably turns out that from a, from an economic standpoint, it would have been better to take the prevent plant payment, particularly given what they did with WIP or the 15% buy up. And then also what's happening with ARC IC and the ability to, if we have a prevent plant, uh, completely prevent plant farm, ARC IC will make a, make a payment. Here are some of the details associated with prevent plant. You can look at those at your, at your uh, um, just, just keep this in the back of your mind if we ever have this happen again. Again, I think just plan June 5th. Presumption being to take a 
to take a prevent plant payment. One of the things to note here in here, our prevent plant payments on our combo products and 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 our combo products will will be a payment based on coverage level. So the higher the coverage level, the higher the payment. It's 55% on corn, 60% on soybeans is that plant or that payment. You can buy up 60 and 65%. So for a small increase in premium, you can buy up that 55 to 60. And I would suggest looking at that, that buy up, it, it, it will aid in those, those, those years. Again, final plant date is the date after which you can take prevent plant payment. Late plant period is 20 days after the final plant period for corn. So final plant date is June 5th over much of the state. Next 20 days, we're seeing that insurance guarantee go down. And then after the late plant parent period, the insurance guarantee is 60% of original. So again, prevent plant, a major thing to consider this year. And again, we hope we don't get there and it's likely that we won't get there, but consider taking that final plant uh, or prevent plant after we reach that final plant date particularly given that most of the time those uh, uh, prevent plant are more regional in nature than we did had this last last year. We're going to now switch gears and talk about some of our premium calculators for 2020 and our insurance, evaluator, insurance evaluator as well. Here is a screenshot of our RP policies for 2020. If you go to our insurance, our, our web tools, and I'm going there right now, go on our website, and you will, if you go onto our website, you will see these tools, payment calculator, payment evaluator, price distribution, and then our downloadable spreadsheet. This downloadable spreadsheet will give you a, a, quite a few details on crop insurance. We're going to do the premium calculator right now, which we have loaded here. All right, I'm going to do our quote for Champaign County. If I can get my thing to work. Oops. I'm having trouble. Let me scroll down. Scroll down for me. All right, we're going to do Champaign County. And here you can put in different different items for your quote it comes preloaded but most of your most people are going to use the trend adjustment yield endorsement you'll put in your trend adjusted yield this is your guarantee yield you put in the unadjusted yield so the difference here is your trend adjustment and for most individuals the APH yield and the rate yield are the same so and in most of most of Illinois the Trend adjusted yields is about 10 bushels higher than the APH yield. We we'll also give this quote for grain, which is what most people are, are doing. Non-irrigated risk class will come up if we have a, a risk, a, a high risk in that county, which Champaign doesn't. We'll give quotes for different acres. Our projected price is set here at 388 near volatilities. You hit calculate premiums. What you will see here is, ah, there, I finally got this thing to work. All right, there's the revenue protection premiums. Enterprise, basic, and optional units will give you quotes from 50 down to 85%. And so our 85% enterprise units will cost $12.96, which is all of one crop in a county. You can divide that up into basic units, which is all of one crop by ownership split. So owned and cash rent acres make one uh, one unit, and then each share rent landowner will be another unit. And finally, if we want to break it down by township sections, it's, it goes up from 12 to $24 per acre. So you can see the premiums here. So 75% uh, in Champaign County will cost roughly $329. That's obviously dependent on your a your APH and trend adjusted yields and that goes up to 1296. Again, most people are right here, 80 and 85%, so you can see the difference in premiums. 
We also give uh, premiums for other products, RP with harvest price exclusion, yield protection. You scroll down a little bit, you will see the area risk plan, which is the county level product, former GRP, GRIP with harvest, harvest uh, GRPHR, but you can see the premiums here for those products. ARP with harvest price exclusion and area yield protection. Go there and you can see um, premiums. You can go to any county in the Midwest and look at those premiums. And those are now, uh, we now know the projected price and the volatility. So those, uh, those premiums will, will be very accurate. Again, overall this year, we we're seeing the same volatility as last year. And that volatility is very critical in determining premiums. Higher the pr volatility, the higher these premiums go. Projected price this year, as Bruce showed, was lower, so that's going to tend to lower premiums. Some counties had rate adjustments down in Illinois. Others had rate adjustments up. Overall, probably these premiums are down a bit, but roughly about the same as last year. It's down a bit in some counties, up a bit, depending on how their rate adjustments went. Yep. So that's the premiums. That leads into our insurance evaluator. I'll, I'll take over a little bit here and uh, kind of go through the next set of materials. Uh, as Gary showed, the premiums can be calculated pretty quickly for about any location in the Midwest. We have a case farm preloaded for every county. Of course, your individual uh, experience will be a bit different and specific, and you'll have to eventually talk with your qualified insurance agent as well. But to continue the example, the next set of questions we want to look at have to do with what happens after you buy crop insurance. And to um, kind of set this up, one can think about the starting conditions this year as a really interesting one, where current prices are a bit below the insurance prices. And so there's some embedded options when you buy insurance about insuring at higher prices. And we want to look, though, at the likelihood of payments, the risk reduction activities, and so on. And to do that, we have an insurance evaluator. Also at our uh, FarmDoc site, you'll, you'll notice the tool up at the top just to give a quick plug our farm doc fd dash tools at ncsa national center for supercomputing applications we now host our calculators and our simulators at the national center for supercomputing applications it's been a fantastic partnership that um, can do some amazing things now that were a little more difficult a few years ago but we're going to go and look at kind of the same kind of example i'll go to champaign county we have a few of these kind of preloaded and we have a different set in the handout, but we'll look at Champaign County just to keep the case going. And since that's where we happen to be, Gary and I happen to be sitting this morning. So when you hit um, Champaign County run for the insurance valuator, we'll first look at the three little tabs here. The case farm will tell us what is the example that we're looking at. And in this case, it's a farm with about 190 bushel average. Uh, the standard deviation of yield or the average amount of variation, if you will, around that 190 up and down up to 40 bushels. Current futures prices, that was as of Friday. We, we know they're dropping a bit this morning. Last I looked about 375. This updates once per day uh, and does do this against the actual uh, price distribution. So it goes out to the uh, real markets and gets the real prices and the real variability and compares that to the insurance product you just bought. A little bit of summary information here on the right hand side given a farm um, that have has this set of conditions we look at both the county and the farm um, likelihood of outcomes a lot of the county products of course are denominated against the county average yield but your own revenue is going to depend on your farm yield which helps explain why rp is the more popular choice frankly but on this farm 30 percent of the year is with a 190 average you'd be a below 170 uh, so this just is the downside tail risk, of course. 30% of the years should be that far above the mean, too. 20% uh, of the years, about 155, and a 1 in 20 chance of being below about 120. We haven't had that experience in a few years, but that's just what the, the math would say is the case. Moving from the case farm to the first tab, the insurance evaluator has a lot of information on it then to say what happens when you buy insurance. And as with the premium calculator, you can switch between basic and enterprise. And we don't do optional 
in this case, just to give the kind of the endpoints of it. But on the farm we just looked at, for coverage levels from 50 to 85%, we have five major categories tabulated. One, the premium per acre. Um, this will correspond to the calculator from the previous page. Uh, if we set up all the same conditions, we're looking again at this point at basic. We could also look at enterprise, for example, and get back to the same numbers as before. Uh, the premiums per acre are given. Uh, the rollover tabs, of course, give some information, but <clears throat> one reason when you increase your coverage level at the higher levels, the premium begins to go up as you're getting much better insurance, of course. You're insuring higher levels of revenue. The other reason is there is a subsidy structure that has a declining percentage of subsidy as the coverage level goes up. The second column, though, after you look at premiums, is the average payment per acre in dollars per acre. And again, this tab exists for virtually all the counties. We have uh, 12 states or so done with all the counties in a case form. Um, the average payment per acre zeroing in at an 80% level would say that if you bought this for 665 on an enterprise unit, on average, your payments would be 2822, which makes it seem like a pretty good deal. Uh, this is, again, because of the subsidy structure and the way crop insurance works. But the next column uh, points out why this is not a pure transfer. 27.5% of the time, you'll get at least some payment, and the rest of the time, you will get no payments. So that's very much consistent with our recent experience as well, a lot of years with not much, and then every now and then large payments. Um, but the average across all those years, sometimes zero, sometimes larger than 28 the average across all those years is 28.22. Uh, looking at what the farmer pays, and these are done on a farmer paid basis. The loss ratios we looked at before were done on a total premium basis. The farmer paid basis means that if you got $28 and you paid $6.65, your net cost of insurance, the fourth column over in each panel, tells you the net effect of buying insurance. And in this case, a negative is a good thing because it means your cost is negative. It's an accounting convention, I realize, but you're getting paid back more than you paid out. So on average, buying this insurance through a long period of time, and again, think of the simulation we're running as being you know, hundreds of millions of years, all at the same conditions as happened today. On average, you'd get back 2157 more than you paid in. And the average gross revenue that you were insuring was 667 on that. As you go up and down the rows, you can just see how the outcomes differ by coverage level that you pick. Uh, RP with HPE um, sometimes pays a bit more, sometimes pays a bit less, but not a very popular uh, product. I think um, you know after 2012, people really just said if there's going to be a harvest price increase, they wanted to have access to that, partly for the ability to do marketing and partly for um, just to see the size of the payments. YP, the right-hand right -hand panel as well, similar uh, calculations uh, for the small number of places where YP is used. And then scrolling down, though we won't spend a lot of time on this, the county level products. Uh, I do want to say one quick thing. The county level products have a, a couple of factors in them that multiply up the amount of payments relative to the revenue to take care of what you would think of as the basis risk between the farm's yield and the county yield. So you can look like you get really high payments, and you do. There are some really, really high uh, average payments. The difficulty, though, is that they don't always occur when you need them. So you can get uh, reasonably high um, yield in the county and have an on-farm disaster and you just simply wouldn't get paid with the group products. So they don't tend to be very popular. Again, moving on to look at the what we think may be in fact the more important way of thinking about it is you can look at all these and you can select by net cost of insurance and likelihood of payment or the amount of revenue you can protect. But the revenue risk tab in here I think is a really nice summary where you can do two things. You can say, for example, if you were a cash rent operation and you had to protect a particular amount of cash flow, you could change your target revenue to you know, whatever your variable plus you know, have to pay costs are, and then evaluate the likelihood with different insurance products of being able to reach those target levels. 
to demonstrate this, I want to just walk through again Champaign County and look first at the graph and then try to make it correspond to the information that um, exists below. Importantly, the top tabulation says if you had no insurance and you had $575 of you know, revenue obligation per acre, you'd have about a one in three chance of not reaching that level. And 1% of the time, in fact, you'd be below 320, 5% of the time you'd be below 408 and so on. 25% of the time you'd be below 545. So that, that's some significant risk. <clears throat> With each of the different insurance products, then we tabulate the likelihood of it, it creating an insured revenue after the outcome. In other words, after you have harvested, after you have either gotten an insurance payment or not, and with all the possibilities of the prices that might occur. This is, a, I think, a very informative graph. It takes a while to get oriented to it, but the likelihood on the left-hand side, and then the different insurance products, and as you scroll over it, you'll see that you can, you can kind of look at a particular level of revenue and say, how do each of the different insurance products compare in terms of their ability to give me uh, the best chance of exceeding that set of obligations. A way to think about this graph is on the bottom, the revenue levels, and the left-hand side, the percentage, what you really want is a high likelihood of high revenue. So you prefer things that are located way off to the right. And with no insurance, you have the blue line. You have zero, almost zero chance of being below 144, about a 60% chance of being below 665. And then as we layer in insurance, you can say which ones cut off tail risk the best or which ones move me to the highest level of expected revenue. Again, we think it's a reasonably complete way of asking the question. And the, the two lines, RP85 and RPHBE85, are kind of hiding each other, but they're the ones that kind of have the vertical line around 548 in the graph. In other words, they cut off the tail risk best, which again explains why farmers are quite rational generally. Uh, does a really nice job of saying at least we're going to have that much revenue no matter what else happens. The area yield products sometimes pay better, so you see they push the distribution to the right a bit, but they don't do as good of a job of cutting off the tail risk, neither does YP. Uh, below the graph are the numeric tabulations of the same information, but split up at a few, instead of reading over on the uh, dollar um, axis and reading up to the probability, this one kind of goes the other direction. So it says at a 1% chance, a 5, a 10, and a 25% chance, we tabulated the low left-hand uh, tail risk numbers. What's the likelihood of my revenue? And again, just to give an example to zero in quickly, if you bought 80% RP, you have a 1 in 20 chance of being below 522 with that. And remember, without crop insurance at all, you had a 1 in 20 chance of being below 408. So you can think of the comparison between these numbers, over $100 increase in, in revenue at the same likelihood just by using the insurance. The, again, invite you to go to the actual live website. You can see the address above or in the handouts. We have it um, kind of explained throughout as well. I uh, want to do one more quick thing, though, while we're looking at it. We can also, our final tool that I'm going to go through and turn it back over to Gary after a quick um, tooling through this, we have a price distribution tool. And again, this one uh, is a really interesting has some very interesting features in that you can pick, we only have it up live now for corn and soybeans, and then the major months of trade, and then wherever there are years that are trading with enough volume or depth in the options markets to estimate it reliably, we um, uh, the tool goes out to the markets, takes all of the option data, comes up with the most likely probability scenarios that would make those uh, prices that are being traded make the most sense, and then just tabulates the pictures. So to look at this quickly, um, we're going to look at, let's say, corn, DEES 2020. And it gives you the information in two related graphs. One is by saying the probability. So 50% of the time, the markets currently say that the prices will be below 373 by expiration. 
Or we could say 388 was the insurance price. What's the likelihood of being below that, for example? So there's a nice little tool at the bottom that you can say, you know, of prices at interest. And as you change this, the, the graph updates. But at a 388, which is, again, the projected price for this year, uh, the markets uh, say that there is a 58 or almost a 60 percent chance that we're not going to be above the insurance price. So uh, you can think of this as providing some additional guidance on the level of coverage to select and whether or not insurance is a good deal, because the price of insurance, this is an important feature, the price of offered insurance through the federal crop insurance program does not depend on the prices that exist at the date of sign up. They depend on the prices that were averaged during the month of February. So if the prices plummet and you have an average in February that's substantially above what the markets are offering, it makes insurance very, very valuable because you've already been given a higher insurance price. Um, we're somewhat in that category now. Um, the same thing for soybeans. Could say for a 917. Uh, graphs give us about a 60% chance that we're going to end the year with the November uh, contract uh, will end the year below the insurance price. Again, these are just um, ways of us asking what do the markets indicate to us that we think or that thinks the uh, price distribution and the price likelihoods will be. And hopefully that provides some helpful evidence for um, uh, making your crop insurance decisions. At this point, we'll skip forward. Those were the slides we were going through kind of in fixed format. We'll get back to um, one of the other important issues and decisions you'll have to make about the SCO. I turn it back over to Gary for that. All right. So SCO, supplemental coverage option. Uh, we have more interest in SCO here recently. You've actually had SCO available to you since 2014. But most of you took our county from 2014 to 2017 under the, the old farm bill. And our SCO is only available if you take price loss coverage. Many of you will be taking price loss coverage if you're following our advice on corn and soybeans, or excuse me, corn and wheat, corn and wheat. We would suggest taking uh, soybeans, uh, taking our county on soybeans. Again, SCO, and again, this is a crop insurance uh, product. You will have to purchase this through your crop insurance agent. And it's, again, only available if you take price loss coverage as your commodity title choice. We have been suggesting that uh, this year farmers and landowners enroll paying farms in ARC IC. Again, you would not be eligible for SCO on those farms. So you would suggest a lean to PLC for corn, and there you would. If you take PLC for corn, you would be eligible for SCO. Lean to ARC County for soybeans, you would not be eligible for SCO. And lean to PLC wheat, and you would be, again, eligible for SCO. So sometimes the question is, should we consider the SCO option as we're making those choices? And my answer to that would be that, generally speaking, if you're taking ARC IC because you're getting a $40 uh, payment, there is no way that SCO would match that payment in 2020. So no, probably not. Um, if you're again, we're, the, these these benchmarks here are largely in place because you're taking an expect or looking at what these programs are going to pay, and usually the commodity title choices uh, outweigh any uh, payments that you could potentially get from SCO. So. Only PLC will be eligible for SCO, and SCO, let me, let's just go over this. SCO coverage level is established at 86%, so you get 86% of the, the, uh, the, 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 the guarantee is based on 86%, and indemnities are triggered on county revenue when you're below that 86% guarantee. In this respect, it's somewhat like ARP or the old GRIP product, it's based on county products that make these payments. Um, so you're getting a county level coverage from 86% to 
to what you selected as your underlying crop insurance. So let's say you picked RP at 85%. Uh, SEO would provide a narrow band of coverage from 86% down to 85%. If you bought 80% RP product, it would provide a coverage in a band from 86% down to 80% of your uh, uh, coverage level. Again, it will give you that band of coverage down to the coverage level chosen on RP, YP, or RP, HPE. Um, here, let's say, let, SCO provide, again, provides county level coverage from 86 to the RP policy. Again, we're, we're, we're talking about this in terms of RP because that's what most people buy. You, would, you could also buy SC on RP and RP with harvest price exclusion, but again, few people do that. Let's say in our example, our, our farmer purchased RP with 75% coverage level on SCO. There will be two, potentially two independent payments. One for the RP policy, 75%, and that RP policy will exact act exactly like RP 75% without SCO. The underlying RP policy does not, and repeat that, does not change. You only get a coverage level on top of that RP policy. If you're looking at that policy, there are then four possibilities. RP and SCO both make payments. And you would have to see, and this could happen, and just to give you a feel for the year that that would happen, it would be like 2012. SCO would make a payment, and RP would make a payment uh, as well. You could have the case of SCO makes a payment and RP does not, and then this would be the case where you have a price decline, but not large enough to trigger RP payment. So your, your RP, uh, your 86% would be triggering a payment, but uh, the other one would not. Third case is RP makes a payment and an SCO does not. And this would be the case where a farm has a poor yielding year and the county does not. And this number three is sort of the warning sign um, because you could have a farm that has a low yield. And if you bought SCO and lowered your RP coverage level, you could, you could be significantly lowering your payment and SCO not making a payment. And then obviously the fourth case is neither make a payment, which is probably like 2016, mm -hmm. 17, and 18. So it remains to be seen my, what SCO will do in 2019. We do not know yet because we don't know the county yields, but there's some chance of making payments, particularly on soybean policies for 2019. All right, so why would you take SCO? All right, so I'm going to give you two examples here. Currently taking 85% RP policy. Um, the pro here, it would add a bit of add a bit of protection. I mean, one percent isn't much, but remember that that SCO is subsidized at a 65% rate. Over time, we would expect, a, and, and roughly, you're going to see in our examples here, that that in LaSalle County will cost $0.71. Cents. Over time, you would expect that to pay out $1.05. Not much, but it's $0.30, cents, right? $0.30, $0.40. Cents. Why leave it on the table? So, and the con there is nothing really. You're paying $0.71 cents more in premium. All right, let's. So that's the that that's you're taking currently taking 85% coverage level. Let's say you're currently taking RP at 75%, and you're doing that at less than the max, and you're probably doing that for a reason. Um, you're probably doing that because the premium costs a lot. That could be either Southern Illinois, where we see rates higher, and again, if we go down to Southern Illinois. We see premiums, you know, we see a lot of a lot of people taking 75 and 80 percent premiums or RP policies. Again, that 85 percent gets pretty costly, so their appetite seems to be, you know, 
15 to $20 an acre is all I want to spend on crop insurance, that puts me in the 75% coverage level. Other areas where you might think about this as a high risk area, um, for example, you have high risk land, you're putting that at a low coverage level, you might want to add SCO on top of that. Or if you're doing optional units and you're taking a lower, lower, cover, lower coverage level, again, um, adding a little bit something to it. Here's the pro, you get a county level coverage from 86% to the RP coverage level. Um, I would say the con, if you can stand the cost, adding the RP coverage level would be better. I mean, it's simply uh, adding, uh, adding, adding uh, more targeted protection to your farm. Let's give an example for LaSalle County. All right, here are the premiums. And, uh, and what we did here was we ran RP premiums for LaSalle County, 1612 was 85%, 764 was 80%, so on and so forth. Um, here is the SCO cost at 85% coverage level. $71 an acre. You combine those two, you get $16.83. Again, over time, uh, you add 71% cents to your premium cost, get 1% more protection, and over time, this thing is probably going to, we would estimate it returning a dollar for in, uh, in, in, extra return or over time it would average a dollar four all right one of the other questions should i lower 85 percent to 80 percent i will lower my premium from 16 dollars 1062 and here's and you do lower the premium obviously but here's the other thing that you do Go back to our premium evaluator. You're lowering the expected payment on RP, and you're switching that with SCO. And in many cases, most cases, in fact, we find that the lower the premium is actually lowered. Um, expected payments lowered from going from 85 to 80 percent. So. You will lower a premium over time. You will lower the expected payments and you will uh, you will get lower 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 risk protection. Um, one other item here, and in this 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 slide just shows that the calculations of what it does. We would uh, going from eighty five to eighty percent. If we look at the premium evaluate, evaluator, it lowers a uh, expected payment by twelve dollars. You would increase the SCO payment by seven dollars. That is that, that that is a net. You're, you're you're lowering your expected payment. The other thing that you do is re, you reduce the potential prevent plant payment because SCO does not count towards the prevent plant payment. So if we lower from 85 to 80 percent, you would be lowering the prevent plant payment. Uh, the, payment that's calculated because remember the prevent plant payment is 55% times the coverage level times the projected price times the guarantee yield. Well, lowering it from 85 to 80%, you're cutting that prevent plant payment if as you're as you're as you're doing that. Overall, we would be say that be skeptical of lowering your RP coverage level to lower your premium uh, to and then use SCO for coverage on that. However, there is absolutely nothing wrong and there's a little bit to be gained by putting SCO on top of RP if and, and, and leaving the, the coverage level the same. You would be gaining a bit of a bit of premium. It's sort of like adding a add-on private add-on products to that policy, except that it's subsidized at a 65% rate. So why not do it? I mean, it's not going to offer you a whole lot of protection, but why not do it? You're picking up a penny or a nickel. Why not reach down and pick up the penny or the nickel? Um, one item here. In 2020, 
you're not eligible for SCO if you take ARC. And again, if I would, many, some people took SCO in 2019. You got a pass last year. You can you can enroll what in whatever you want uh, for your commodity title choice for 2019, and it will not impact your SCO payment or whether you're eligible for SCO or not. So don't worry if you took SCO that you have to do something you're, that restricts your commodity title choice by the deadline March 16th, which you should all be in to FSA by now. Uh, but if you take SCO and you do sign up for our county for 2020, that is a problem. And, and really the key date is June 15th, because you have to report the number of acres that you're eligible for SCO on that date. So that's the date that's critical. And if you purchase SCO on ARC acres, SCO will be canceled and you will still owe 60% of the SCO premium. So don't want that to happen. So avoid doing that. So where we want to thank our webinar sponsor, and I guess Bruce or have no. Thank you very much again to our webinar sponsors and to those of you who stuck it out to the end. We still have a pretty good participation. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and available in the future at our website, as will the handouts. And encourage you to uh, take the um, uh, chance to visit our website as well and take and uh, kind of look through the tools yourself and send us questions if you have any. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Root on much. the lion eye as they move into the Big Ten tourney. Friday, right? That's right. And hopefully the stock market and all markets come back by then. See you later.